So in a few minutes I'll try and materialise a talk. So those of you who want to go out, go out. Make a run for it quickly before I start my jokes. Those of you <laughs> who have got more tolerance of bad humour, please stay. Okay. Somebody again this evening gave me a great suggestion for a talk which is uh, concerning uh, how we put these teachings into practice uh, in life. And uh, it's the talk this evening is on how to deal with difficult people. <laughs> I'm sure that's relevant to your life. I don't know why there's so many difficult people in, in the world, but I'm sure you've met many of them, and even today. And uh, the reason I give talks like this is to show just how we can apply these great uh, insights uh, from meditation and Buddhism to help solve many of the problems in this world. Because the whole point of Buddha's teachings is to lessen suffering, to give more freedom as we go closer and closer and closer so the pure freedom and uh, bliss and ease of enlightenment. And I know uh, just this afternoon giving a talk at Curtin University, I was reminded of something I said even last Monday night, where some people have never heard of Buddhism before, were asking the old question, well, you know, is Buddhism a way of life or is it a religion? You should know the answer to that question. It is a religion for tax purposes. <laughs> You have to be practical about these things. You just ask our treasurer. But it's also, it's a way of life, it's a way of dealing with the problems of life. It's many, many things. And I usually focus on uh, the practical aspects of Buddhism in this Friday night talks and today, how to deal with the difficult people who you see from time to time in your life, when you meet with them. And don't think that just because I'm a monk and you live in nice monasteries, you don't have your share of difficult people. Because I don't know what it is like that sometimes as a monk you attract difficult people. I'm not saying that you're difficult. <coughs> because people have got nowhere else to go, and sometimes a monk's kindness and compassion means that, you know, you accept everybody. But, first of all, how you deal with difficult people, to know that difficult people are par for the course. And so when we understand that, we understand it's not unusual to have difficult people. No matter what you do and where you go and how you behave, you're always going to meet them. So, first of all, there's nothing wrong with having difficult people. In fact, we can look upon difficult people, as my teacher Ajahn Chah says, as great blessings to our life. They teach us patience. They teach us compassion. They actually lead to so much wisdom. Really, you don't learn so much from the nice guys and the nice girls of life, do you? You have a good time with them. But where you really learn your lessons is with the difficult ones. Which is why that I learned from my teacher in Thailand. You know, Ajahn Chah. You know, Ajahn means teacher. And he said that anything which is irritating you, anything which is troubling you, that is your teacher. So being in Northeast Thailand, we'd always call the mosquitoes Ajan Mosquito. <laughs> because I learned so much for those damn mosquitoes. <laughs> well, that's what I thought at the time, those mosquitoes. It's even when we used to do loving kindness. For those of you who are Buddhists, you know that we spread loving kindness to all people, all beings. All genders, no matter what you are and who you are, may all beings be happy and well. However, as a young man, being a monk in Thailand, I just could not do that. It's impossible. So I did the best I can. I used to chant, may all beings be happy and well, except mosquitoes. <laughs> may all beings be free from suffering, but not those mosquitoes. don't deserve it, what they've done to me. And they would, 
<laughs> I'm sure that if ever you spread loving kindness, you have also got exceptions. But it didn't work well when I had exceptions. So I learned how to learn from those mosquitoes, to be kind to them. Sometimes I was so kind to those mosquitoes, I let them bite me. They would land on my, my hand. So come on mosquito, you can bite me. The door of my heart's open to you. It's only a little bit of blood. I know that you need this to have your dinner. And I like my dinner as well, especially as a monk. Now this is your dinner, so have something to eat. You know what those mosquitoes did? Sometimes difficult people and difficult beings are like this. They take advantage of you. They put their nose into the skin. You know, it's irritating, so you just endure that. It's only a few seconds. But these mosquitoes, that was just an exploratory drill. They took their nose out, walked a few steps and tried somewhere else. They were fussy. <laughs> and you'd have three or four bites just from one mosquito. They were taking advantage of my kindness. Whatever. That's just the nature of mosquitoes. And it doesn't matter, I had plenty of blood and I learned a lot from that. So number one, first of all, know that the difficult people and difficult beings and difficult situations in life, that's common, there's nothing wrong. You never find any place where you can run away and hide and uh, escape from difficult people or difficult mosquitoes or difficult uh, experiences. So number one, you have to accept them. And you have to learn how to deal with them. One is learn that they're part of life and you can learn so much from them. And number two is to realize that really most of the difficulty of difficult people is actually coming from you, the way we react to them. I know somebody once said, if ever you see a difficult person, remember you only have to endure them for, for maybe a few minutes, a few hours at most. Even if you live with them, it's your husband or your wife. I don't know why you chose that person anyway, that's your karma. <laughs> but anyway, once you chose them. <laughs> well, even if they're that close to you, you only have to live with them for a short period of time. But they have to live with themselves all day. And sometimes when you think that how irritating they are for you, they'll be equally irritating towards themselves. And those poor people have to live with that mind 24 hours a day. It's a wonderful reflection when you see difficult people. You know that if they're that difficult to, for you to live with, they're also difficult to live with themselves. And that gives you all so much compassion. So it takes away the hurt which you feel. And you notice the hurt that they feel, that they're so difficult to you. So this is actually empathizing with the other person, taking the pain away from yourself. Why do I have to deal with this person? and get an idea what they're going through in their head, in their mind, in their, in their um, life. Because some of these people, if they're that difficult to you, and you're an ordinary person, imagine they've probably got no friends, no one they can really relate to, because they're just such an incredibly difficult character to live with, they're so lonely. So that actually arouses a bit of compassion to such people. When you have compassion to that, such people, your endurance levels go up enormously. You can actually bear you know, with dealing with such difficult people, because you know they're not going to be around for long. They're going to walk out of your office, or you're going to go home to somebody else. And even if you can't escape from them, you can always come on a retreat in my monastery, or in Dhammasala monasteries, or someplace you can get away. So that's one thing you can do. But it's also to know that the difficult people in life, you can actually change them. It's a wonderful thing to know that difficulties which you face in life, or difficulties which they experience, they are impermanent. They're not always there. It's just a phase which people go in their life being difficult. Of course that phase might last from birth until death, but it ends eventually. It's, it's not forever. But it's nice to know you can actually change people, you can actually see them grow. And how you change people it's a wonderful psychology which I've learned as a teacher, how you can interact with people and take the cause of their being difficult to themselves and others and actually just move that, nudge that in the sense of learn to be <coughs> more kind, more sensitive, less demanding and less of a pain to live with. It's wonderful you can do that. And how is that done? 
I was mentioning in a talk this afternoon at Curtin University. I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, but this was a powerful little um, uh, experience which I had about a month ago, maybe even longer, six weeks ago, in Singapore. I was invited to give a talk at a conference at the Institute of Mental Health. It was one big anniversary of the, the hospital. So they invited me over with all these other psychologists, psychiatrists, doctors and professors as a monk to give a talk on how to deal with mental health. And what I was talking about there was the things which you've heard here before, but what I was really impressed with was afterwards there was a devout Christian who was head of one of the wards, departmental head, and he invited me to his ward to do some Buddhist chanting. And I was in it, but he told me actually not to tell anybody, and now I've blown it. <laughs> and I said, why do you say that? He said, because what you said just makes so much sense. And he said, I really respect that wisdom. He said, what I respect most of all is you're telling us something which we've only recently been practicing, where we don't focus on the times of the day where our patients are sick and difficult. The times when they experience delusions or psychosis and are dysfunctional. We just put that aside. And the times that they are apparently healthy, where they are relating to themselves and their environment in a sensible way. Because when a person has a mental dysfunction, it's not 24 hours a day. They have periods, times when they're sort of in some sort of delusional state and times when they come out afterwards. They said they were focusing on the times when they weren't delusional. And they said by focusing on the times when they were healthy, they said a healing was happening. The times when they were healthy were extending and the times when they were dysfunctional were decreasing. And I've been teaching that for years. It's wonderful to see that has got into a modern health system in the only sort of mental hospital which they have in that city-state. And I know that's the same with difficult people. If you focus on their difficulties and make a big deal about that, you're actually encouraging those difficulties. You're feeding them. And eventually they'll get worse and worse and worse. There's a classic story, and I've used this so many times. If you haven't heard this before, it's a very good one to hear. If you have heard it before, you're learning how to be patient with a difficult monk who keeps on repeating the stories. <laughs> Either way, it works. <laughs> and that's that great story of the, the demon who came into the Emperor's palace. Demon coming into an Emperor's palace. An Emperor was away. And because he was away, there was a monster. A big, ugly, terrifying demon came and strolled right in to the palace. He was so frightening, so terrifying. Everybody froze in horror at this ugly, disgusting, slimy demon. Allowing the demon to go right through into the heart of the palace and sit on the emperor's throne. And as soon as he sat on the emperor's throne, that was just too much for the guards and the ministers. They came to their senses and they said, Get out of here! Who do you think you are? This is our emperor's seat, not yours. Get out or else. And at those harsh words, the demon grew an inch bigger, more ugly, more smelly, and the language got far worse. And that made the soldiers and ministers even more upset. They got out their swords, they got out clubs, they clenched their fists. But, at every unkind word, every angry deed, even every unkind thought, the monster just grew an inch bigger, more ugly, more terrifying, more smelly. And the language from the monster got worse and worse and worse. And this had been going on for quite some time before the Emperor came back 
And at this time, that demon was so huge, he took up half the throne room. He was massive. And talk about ugly and frightening. I've never seen alien movie, but people said the alien is pretty uh, uh, terrifying. Now imagine the alien multiplied by a thousand. This was so terrifying. Not even, I said, DreamWorks could manufacture such a terrifying and horrible spectacle as this ugly demon. And according to the story, the smell, the stench coming off this demon's body would make maggots throw up. It takes a lot to make a maggot sick. <laughs> and the language coming from this demon was worse, was worse than you'd hear in Northbridge after both the Eagles and the Dockers lose. <laughs> so this was a problem. A real difficult being coming into the palace. But when the emperor came back, the reason he was emperor because he'd been to Nolamar and heard the talks and was wise. <laughs> I always change his stories every time, embellish them this way and that way, so you could always hear a new angle. So the, the emperor, you know, had also you know, read Open the Door of Your Heart, which is available at the bookshop for $25. <laughs> I've also learned marketing. I was at a, it's an entrepreneurship business conference this afternoon. But anyway, <laughs> the emperor said, Welcome. Ah, oh, monster, thank you so much for coming to visit me. Why have you waited such a long time to come and pay me a call? And at those few kind words, the monster grew an inch smaller, less ugly, less smelly, less offensive. And all the people in the palace realized their mistake. Instead of saying, get out of here, you don't belong. What are you doing in here? You don't belong in here. They started to say, welcome. And one of them said, actually, do you want something to drink? And we've got some orange juice, freshly squozen. Squeezed, squozen, I don't know, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like something to eat? We've got some nice... Um, curry puffs. Are they available this evening? I don't know what was. I didn't see what's up. We've got some curry puffs. We've got some sandwiches. Someone said, we like a pizza. I can ring out. Monster size, of course, from someone like you. Someone, someone gave the monster a foot massage. Have you ever a foot massage? Imagine a monster with such big feet. It took about ten of them to give each feet a massage. <laughs> someone asked, do you want a cup of tea? We have English tea. We have peppermint, it's good for your health. <laughs> or a cup of coffee, latte, cappuccino, or Brazilian. I don't really know what I'm talking about with coffee, I just eat whatever I'm given. <laughs> so anyway, at every kind word, or kind deed, or kind thought, the demon grew any small, less like less offensive, less smelly. It wasn't such a long time, even before the monster pizza arrived, he was back down to the size when he first began, when he first came in. And they kept on laying on the kindness until that demon got so tiny, one more act of kindness and that demon vanished completely away. And the Buddha told that story in the Udana, but there was no mention of pizzas and peppermint tea. I made that up. <laughs> but the Buddha told that story in the Udana, he said, we call those things anger-eating demons. When you give them anger, they get bigger, less ugly, less offensive, less smelly, their language gets worse. He said the way, only way we can, we can overcome the anger-eating demons in life is with kindness. Welcome, thank you for visiting me. Now many of the difficult people you meet in life are anger-eating demons. You give them anger, you say, get out of here, you don't belong in here. It actually does get worse. So instead of saying, get out of here, you don't belong, some of the dif difficult people, you say, welcome. Thank you for coming to bother me. <laughs> we don't actually say that. We say, thank you for coming to visit me. And give them kindness. 
Now sometimes people say, well that doesn't work. It might be okay for you as a monk. You know, maybe Ajahn Brahm's got psychic powers. You can actually get into their head and their mind and sort of rearrange their neural pathways so they're not difficult with you. But no, it does work. One of the first time ever, 20 years ago, when I told this story, it was when I was teaching in prison, in Karnat Prison Farm, just down the road from my monastery. We still go there most Fridays. And when I was teaching that at Karnat Prison Farm, one of the prisoners complained. And he said, that is just like New Age rubbish. It doesn't work in the real world, especially in a prison. Prisons are tough places. If you've got a difficult person, you've got to stand up for yourself. That's the only language they understand. And of course, I wasn't having any of that. I said, I don't believe you. He said, you don't live in prison. I said, well, monastery, we have cells. We have wall around. Actually, they don't have a wall around Carnet. They have a wall around our monastery. Actually, sometimes people, in the early years, they'd actually drive all the way to Carnet Prison Farm and ask, where are the monks? It was very embarrassing. <laughs> Lucky there weren't any monks in it. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, I challenged this guy. I said, okay, in this prison, who is the most difficult person you have to deal with? And the prisoner I challenged, was with a number of other prisoners, he said, the chief officer. He said, the chief officer, he said, my job is to serve him tea and coffee every day. That's my job in prison. I hate that guy. He's always really nasty. And he told me a story which happened the week before. One of the prisoners in Karnat, he hardly ever had a visit from his family because it's such a hard place to get to. There's no public transport. And if you're poor and haven't got a car, you just have to find a friend who can actually take you all that way. It's a difficult place to get to. He said, this man's wife had managed to get a lift to come and see him. But before you could go and see you know, your relations in prison, you have to check in, say your name, go through all the security stuff. And the chief officer had seen this woman checking in and knew that she had come to see this prisoner and decided to be cruel to the prisoner. On the PA system, he said, so and so, no, you've got a job for you on the other side of Carnet Prison Farm and sent him to a place where the PA system didn't reach. Now, it's a huge prison farm. He did it on purpose because as soon as uh, his wife had checked in, the PA system announced, prisoner so-and-so, your wife is here, please go to the visitors area. But he couldn't hear it from where he'd been sent. The message was repeated two or three times. They went to a search to try and find him. They did find him. By the time they found him and he came back, visiting hours are over. Better luck, better luck next time. He said the chief officer did this on purpose, with no reason other than spite and trying to give the prisoners a harder time than they deserved. He said that's why in the time in prison he was called a dog. And I said, you hate him? He said, yes, really big time. He's just so difficult. He never respects us, never says anything to us. He always puts us down and treats us like dirt. I said, great, this is a challenge. You meet him every day, serving tea and coffee. Be kind to him. Don't embrace him with your arms. You get in trouble that way. <laughs> but at least you can embrace him with your heart. And so how you can do that is, every time you serve a cup of tea or coffee, Try and put some love and care into that tea and coffee. Try and make it the most beautiful, delicious cup of coffee you possibly can, can make. Find out what he likes. And be kind. Give it lots of love and compassion whenever you serve him tea and coffee. So, all credit to this prisoner. He tried it for a week. And when I came back, after one week, how's it going? He said, look, it's a complete waste of time. I'm really trying hard to be kind to this guy. But every time, even I put lots of effort into making a nice cup of tea and coffee, he completely ignores me. As if I don't exist. As if I'm lower than a cockroach. He even says to the cockroach, get out of here, but not me. So I told him, carry on. And it was about, I'm not sure how long, maybe a couple of months. I had to encourage him and force him to do this before we got 
what I call the big breakthrough. Because one day, I actually came to visit and he couldn't, couldn't wait to tell me this. He said he made this prison officer a beautiful cup of coffee with cream or whatever he found. Just the stipend he thought the prison officer liked. And managed to find him some biscuits which he'd noticed the prison officer liked. And said, here you are sir, have this coffee and I found some special biscuits which I know you like. And the prison officer said, Ugh. He grunted. That was our breakthrough. <laughs> It was the first time he acknowledged that this prisoner actually lived and existed and breathed. So that grunt, I said, wow, this is exciting. That is the crack in the damn wall. And I was right. It was only about two or three weeks later. The prisoner managed to find a special cup of tea, a sandwich or whatever, hand it to this prison officer, the chief officer, who was a dog. And the chief officer turned around and said, thank you. And all the other prisoners were telling me this, and they were all looking at me, and they said, you don't realize just how the prison grapevine works. That has gone to every prison in the state. That this chief officer could say thank you to a prisoner was unbelievable. I won the challenge. I knew I'd win eventually. Even such a dog, you can change into a like, cuddly little puppy <laughs> with lots and lots and lots of kindness. You can turn difficult people around, but it just takes a lot and a lot of patience, a lot of kindness. Some of you will not be able to do that. It's too much for you, so you have to know your limitations. But it does work if you really push at it. The most difficult people can become the best of your friends. And sometimes it's a challenge which is worth facing in life. You have people in the office, give them kindness. But when they give sort of uh, unkindness back to you and difficulty to you, know your limitations. If you have to run away, fine. If you have to sort of talk to them and point out what it feels like, there's that, oh, what I talked about this afternoon in the conference. It's also just what I've talked about here, the old sandwich technique. If you do have to tell a person that, you know, you are being difficult to me, I've got my own space I need to protect, or whatever, you don't go blurting the negative stuff out straight away. That will never work. Whenever you are talking to someone and you want to bring up a difficult problem, in other words, to criticize them, to tell them they're making a problem for you, sandwich technique. Two or three pieces of praise, first of all. Now you're a really nice person, just the way you work, you're so diligent, you just, you know, you, you're so well dressed, or whatever, something which praises them. And then you tell them, you know, you tell them, you know, it's like if some people wanted to criticize me. You say, Ajahn Brahm, you're such a nice monk, coming all the time, giving these talks, and they're very inspiring. And when you say things like that, I open up to you, oh wow, you like me, I'm listening to you. And then you say, but your jokes are sometimes a bit over the top. <laughs> but I know, but you know, that you do sort of look after the monasteries, look after the Buddhist society, you praise afterwards. Now if you actually sandwich your criticism between heaps and heaps of praise, people actually listen to it. So if you are dealing with a difficult person, and you really need to tell them, they really need to listen to you to know exactly what they're doing and the problems they're causing. Please praise them first of all. Get on the right side. Because then they know they're not being attacked. Now push this back at you. Isn't that what you need when you're being told off? Because you are difficult people as well. <laughs> sometimes I aren't you? It's always somebody else, but sometimes we create difficulties for others. So if I was going to tell you off, this is how I would do it. You know, I'd praise you first of all, and you know, butter you up make you know that I appreciate and value and care for you. Because if we just give criticism straight away, what we feel is, that person, why are they my enemy? Why are they just saying this to me? Don't they realize how hard I work and the difficulties and the problems I have to face? When you get criticism straight away, you just get defensive, you justify yourself, and you just don't listen to the other person. You don't take it on board. So by just getting that sort of acceptance the very fact that you know, you're accepted, you're appreciated, you're valued, means you're opening up. And then you put the criticism in, you butt it over afterwards, but you know, I really like you, you're really valued, thank you for being who you are. And then people actually can listen. 
You know, a lot of times people don't realize they're being difficult to you. It's weird, but they think they're being a friend. They think they're just being them, or they're being funny, or they're being whatever. So sometimes we do need feedback to know exactly what we're doing and how we come across. I remember playing this game once with uh, one of my fellow monks about 32 years ago. We just sat down and we wrote what we thought of each other. And then we passed it to each other. It was amazing to, to, for me to listen to what another person thought of me. It wasn't what I thought he thought of me. And what I thought of him wasn't what he thought I thought of him. Completely different. The way that we relate to each other is not actually the way that we are thought of. So sometimes people don't realize they're being difficult. So they do need some feedback. That has to be done on the, on the sandwich technique at the right time and place. And then people will take it aboard and they can change. And how do they change? Make sure they're not put in the situations where that difficulty arises from in the beginning. One of the reasons why people are difficult, why sometimes you are difficult, because people are too stressed out. When you're stressed out at work, you take it back home, give people a hard time at home, and then because you're hard time at home, you have family problems, when you go back to work, you're stressed out at work, even before you begin your day. You know, the cycle of negativity and stress. So much so that we really should deal with that problem, whether at home or at work, to learn how to de-stress. And to be able to de-stress, a little bit of meditation really works. You know the old story, how heavy is a cup? The longer I hold it, the heavier it feels. If I keep holding this for five minutes, my arm aches. Ten minutes, I'm in great pain. If I keep holding this for half an hour, I'm a very stupid monk. <laughs> so what should I do when it starts to get heavy? Put it down for five minutes. If you don't believe me, you can try this out at home. <laughs> it works. After five minutes, you pick it up again, it's much lighter. It feels lighter. It's exactly the same way. It feels lighter because you have rested. So your s stress is nothing to do with how much work you have. The amount of responsibilities and duties you are, that is not the cause of stress. The cause of stress is when it gets too heavy to bear, you don't know how to put it down. You're afraid of putting it down. For a few minutes to rest, to get your energies and strength back up. And you will find, as any psychologist or monk would tell you, actually we teach a psychologist, so where they, all, they get all their ideas from. <laughs> we should patent them, but you know, we give things out for free. <laughs> this is the work you have. You find if you put it down for five or ten minutes, it's not five or ten minutes wasted. It's actually an investment of time. Because when you're rested, Afterwards, the quality of your work improves enormously. You get more done in less time too. You become more efficient. And sometimes at work we mistake the quantity of work for its quality and efficiency. Giving yourself a break, 10 minutes of meditation, rest or whatever, and I recommend the toilet is a great place to meditate. Put on engage there, no one will bother you. You can always tell, say you're constipated, you're not lying because your brain was constipated. <laughs> and then rest for a few minutes. When you come out afterwards, you make up that 10 minutes you spent in the loo very quickly. So you get more work done, more efficiently, higher quality, and you're not stressed out. So when you go home, you can enjoy the company of your relations and now your kids and the, your wife, your husband, and even actually relax and enjoy your dinner. Because when you enjoy the company of home again, it's, home is supposed to be a place where you de-stress. You can relax, have a good dinner, meet the people you love and care for. So when you have a nice rest in the evening, you go back to work in the morning and then you sort of come. It's a cycle which you can either have a vicious cycle of stress and argument at home, more stress at work and you get really crazy, or you can break that cycle, rest a little bit at work, you get more done, you come home, you relax, everything is go going well at home, so you're happy at work as well, you get more done there. That's a cycle when you don't become a difficult person to live with. 
That's why I say to people when they come on meditation retreats, so they do a meditation here on a Saturday afternoon or beforehand. Why do you meditate? Because other people have to put up with you. <laughs> That's one of the great reasons to meditate. And if you meditate, you're a much nicer person afterwards. Many times when I've been teaching meditation, especially down at Armadale. I don't know why this happens always in Armadale group. In Armadale group, sometimes after the meditation, talking to people afterwards, and very often people say, you know, this evening I never wanted to come. It's you know, so Tuesday evening, I've been at work and I'm tired. And I told my kids, I'm not going this evening. And my daughter said, Mummy, you must go to meditation. I, said, I don't feel like it, darling, I'm tired. Mummy, you must go to meditation. No, not this evening. Mummy, go to meditation. Why, darling? Because you're a much nicer mummy when you come back. <laughs> and so they go. Many of the kids actually understand that. They can see the change in you when you de-stress. So you're not such a difficult mother or a difficult uh, father to your own kids. So this is actually how you can see in practice a little bit of rest makes people less difficult people to live with. So you're seeing the cause of these things. So it's not just being compassionate and kind. It's actually knowing the causes of being difficult and dealing with them. You know, by giving yourself a bit of rest, being de-stressed. And one of the other things about being a difficult person, you know what it's like sometimes? Just so much stuff comes on top of you. You've got so many things to do. I've had an incredibly busy week. But when I get a busy week, I try really hard never to get negative. Sometimes I think, oh, why me? Why do I have to deal with all these crazy people? Why do I have to take all these calls? Sometimes from overseas, people ring up. They're crazy. It's what I've called here, dial a monk service. <laughs> Sometimes even people have lost their dog you know, over in sort of Canada somewhere. And they say, can you do some chanting for me <laughs> over the phone? <laughs> I was saying today that I was in Japan three or four weeks ago, and Japan is such a high-tech country. And if we ever actually maybe do a fundraiser soon to buy a robot monk, you know, like a cyborg, you know, just can look like me or any other monk, and put a robe on it. And so if there weren't any chanting, you can just, you know, put a donation in a little slot in here, press a button, and we can give you the blessing services. Or well, even on a Friday night, if I'm not feeling myself and just want a bit of a rest, I can put myself, my cyborg up here. You put one of the old uh, CDs in there, of, of favourite talk, <laughs> press the button and no one know the difference. <laughs> it's it's an, an idea, it's got some potential. <laughs> but I will never do that, because some sort of thing, why do I have to work so hard? Because when you get sort of negative, you do become a difficult person to live with. So I know that whatever you have to do in life, you embrace it. Have fun with it. If you teach, you teach a person to have fun with the difficulties of life, to embrace them, then you find you never get a difficult character. So you see a person who is a difficult person to live with. It is because they're fighting their life. And they're angry at just what life gives them. I know they're probably working too hard. Why do I have to do all of this? Why does all these things happen to me? Why is this life so tough for me? And they take it out on you and all the other people they live with. Hope I never take it out on the monks, which I live with. Instead, you know, you just embrace it, take it on board. It's just life. You can't change life. But as I said many times, you can always change the attitude you have to life. It's an attitude problem we have, that's all. What's wrong with working hard? I can only do one thing at a time. That's all I ever do. That's why we always, we never get angry at people not turning on th mobile phones. We embrace that. <laughs> Thank you so much for giving me you know, uh, an opportunity to explain just how you can embrace the difficulties of life. <laughs> 
And so, look, I had a choice. I could get angry at someone not turning off their mobile phone. What I get angry for? It's already been turned on. Big deal. So, you don't get angry at life. You just embrace it. People make mistakes. I make mistakes. I made a big mistake. I hope she's not here today. Last Sunday, I was doing a marriage service for one of the people who comes here regularly. She married to a nice young boy. Uh, see, that's, you always have to get married to a boy, I suppose, if you're a girl. <laughs> but I don't know why I said that. But anyway, that she was getting married. And after the service, doing the, doing the blessing service, and I said to her, I said, I said to him, and that's right, this, this elderly man came to stand next to him. And I said, oh, is that your, your father? And the old man said, no, I'm the best man. <laughs> he was not very happy at me. Well, like I was, uh, <laughs> I was telling a funeral director on, uh, when was it, on Wednesday, Tuesday, no, Thursday, Thursday, yesterday, I was telling the funeral director about one of the funerals I did once. Uh, for a couple, of, this couple who comes here, sort of one of their parents, one of their parents died, and doing the funeral service and saying, oh, it's such a shame that, you know, your mother passed away, she was such a good Buddhist, and she'd done so much, and then this old lady stood up at the back and said, it's not me, it's my husband. I'm alive, it's he who's dead. <laughs> so I do stupid things many times. <laughs> but when you make a stupid thing, instead of getting tense about it, and being a difficult person, you laugh at life. And I actually try and collect all my stupid mistakes and try and uh, tell you all about them so, so, so that you laugh. It's when you make a mistake, it's like a wonderful opportunity to make people laugh. <laughs> and that's why one of the sayings, when you ever make a stupid mistake and people laugh, you laugh as well. Because then the wor world never laughs at you, it only laughs with you. So we laugh as well at the stupidity of life and making a mistake. And that way we embrace and accept things, even the difficult things, and we don't become a difficult person. No matter what you have to deal with, you can embrace and make it work. So if you learn that, then you're not one of the difficult people in life. You know, it's always other people who are difficult. No matter who those other people are, they're us. So when we learn how not to be difficult, we can maybe give those, trick, those skills to other people. But not be so demanding of life, by having an attitude which is more accepting of life. I mean, it's a problem, we know how to deal with it with the, uh, the what's it called, uh, the uh, sandwich method. And that way the other people in yourself can actually live peacefully together. But I've already mentioned in passing, the most difficult person in your whole life is not the boss from hell. The most difficult person is not sort of the uh, person you, you uh, uh, married or your mother-in-law. Somebody actually told me, you know, mother-in-law is an anagram. You can actually change the letters of mother-in-law and it comes out Hitler woman. <laughs> I might get into trouble for that one. But it's true, work it out, write out mother-in-law and it comes Hitler woman. But many mothers-in-law are not Hitler women, so they're very nice people. But whoever is a difficult pers person in your life, you know, sometimes that can be you. And the most, actually they're not the most difficult person in life. The most difficult person in life is yourself. Isn't it? The one you have a hardest time living with at peace and embracing and being kind to is you. And it's important to recognize that. Learning to live with difficult people, first of all, you have to learn how to live with a difficult you. And what's the difficulty with you? Anyway, who do you want to be? And of course, if you want to be something other than you are, if you want to be the great meditator who can fly through the air on a Friday evening, you've never seen that before, that would make it interesting. Or if you always want to give the best talks, or if you always want to be the wisest and skillful um, comedian and get everyone always to laugh at your jokes. Actually, one of the, uh, my favorite comedians, he once said, he wrote his autobiography, and he said when he was young, he always wanted to be a comedian. 
He said his friends would laugh at him for wanting to be a comedian. Now he's a comedian, they don't laugh anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what was the other, one of his other favorite jokes was he said, when I die, he was contemplating on death, which is a Buddhist thing to do, so this is almost a Buddhist joke. He said, when I die, I want to die in my sleep, just like my father, he died in his sleep. Not like, in, not like the passengers in the bus he was driving at the time, screaming and shouting. <laughs> that was a nice joke. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, where was I going from this story? So, it's like being kind to yourself and accepting yourself is actually learning not to be your own enemy not to be a difficult person to yourself. So, you know, I have got my idiosyncrasies and they've all been on display for the last 20 years in this place. You know, you know who I am. But you accept yourself as you are. You relax. You allow yourself to make mistakes. You allow yourself to be who you are. You have this beautiful sense of embracing yourself with all of your idiosyncrasies. In other words, you become at peace with yourself. And that's actually what many people do when they come to a place like this. They learn how to accept themselves as they are, to be at peace with themselves, and not being the most difficult person in the world to live with. Strange thing, that as a monk I spend many, many hours by myself. Well, sometimes people ask that, as a monk, you never had a wife, haven't got kids, Aren't you ever lonely? Sometimes on retreat, you never speak to a person two weeks, did a six month retreat once, never spoke to a person or saw anyone for six months. Weren't you lonely? I had to ask them when they asked that question, actually, I'm never lonely. I never feel sort of wanting to have to be with people, but I like people, but I don't have to be with people. So even in times of solitude, I never feel lonely. When they asked me that question the first time, I thought, why not? And I realized, actually, that there's always somebody around. Me. And so because I'm a friend of myself, because I like me, I'm always with my best friend. At night time in my cave where I live at Serpentine, I always go to sleep with my best friend. Me. And because I'm at peace with myself, and accept myself, understanding I'm not perfect, but I'm good enough, then I'm never lonely. Lonely people are people who don't like themselves. People who are afraid of themselves. So when no one else is around, you're with this strange and terrifying being called me, which you haven't really made peace with yet, haven't really understood yet. But once you understand who you are, you, you accept yourself with some kindness. You become at peace with yourself. Actually, you like yourself. You find one of the greatest insights you could ever have is I'm okay insight. To realize there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. As you are, you are per perfect. You don't believe that, which is why you keep trying to change yourself. When you make peace with yourself and accept yourself for who you are, then you're a friend to yourself. You never feel lonely, because you're there all the time. Only people who don't like themselves feel lonely. They are the biggest problem. They are the difficulty. And something strange happens. Once you actually solve that difficulty, you, and make peace with yourselves and at ease with yourself, no one else in the world will ever be difficult for you. There won't be difficult people anymore. Because the difficulty of other people is just a projection from yourself. It's why I've noticed when people criticize others, he talks too much. I notice the person doing the criticism also talks too much. When I've seen people say, You're, you eat too much. It's only fat people say others eat too much. It's amazing to how people criticize because it's something in their character they don't like about themselves which they project onto other people.
I've noticed that and I think it's a common sort of psychological trait. So, the only reason you find other people difficult is because you find yourself difficult. So if you can actually heal the problem with coming to peace with yourself, being at ease with yourself, accepting yourself, then you can find you can accept just about every other being. And of course, as a monk, I'll come to peace with myself a long time ago. So there's crazy people come and talk to me, stupid people come and talk to me, wise people, beautiful people, but they're all beautiful people, it's just who they are. So I respect people. And of course, I've been in these jails and so these, these real crooks in the jails, I've been talking to politicians and see the crooks on the outside as well. <laughs> it's, <laughs> so they're not real crooks. They're just, you know, people, they're trying to do their best, but sometimes they, they got their defilements as well. So when you start to see people for who they are, and you can accept them and be with them as they are, then there's no such thing as a difficult person anymore. I remember this one lady, no other monk would be able to talk with her. She'd come on the telephone, I think Rona Sono knows who I'm talking about, and she would swear, F words, bloody words, bloody monks, I'm going to come up there with an M16 and shoot you all. I said, okay, that's a nice thing to do. <laughs> I understood her. No, she's a really difficult person. You know, but because I never reacted back, was only reacted kindness, uh, she almost loved me. I said, oh, you're the only person who understands me. And of course, she never came to the monastery with an M16 to shoot us all. She was just taking out her venom on someone who would listen and not take it seriously so I could understand where she was coming from, the pain of her life, the difficulties of her life, and embracing her for who she was. And then she would calm down and become very peaceful and tell me all about her life. A very painful, difficult life. She was not a problem. She was not a difficulty. Because I understood myself, I could understand her. So you can actually calm down the so-called difficult people in this world when you have learned how to calm down yourself. And then everybody in the world is not difficult anymore. And it's not as if they continue those bad habits which other people think is difficult. Because you can calm them down, accept them peacefully, they don't need to express that difficulty anymore in those dysfunctional ways. It's exactly the same as in that hospital you're focusing on the beautiful parts of them. And the beautiful parts of them grow. How we can deal with difficult people in life. And not just difficult people, the difficulty in ourselves. And the difficult situations in life, which occur again and again and again in life. Your flight gets cancelled because Bangkok airport is closed. Wonderful, you can spend more time in Perth. Those people in Bangkok, what a great place to say, you get two extra days of holiday and your boss can't actually blame you. It's always, why do we make life difficult? Instead of exploiting life, when life doesn't go the way we want it, great, wonderful. And even when people criticize you, unfairly, what a wonderful experience that is, to be criticized and test yourself out. I don't know when was the last time I told this story about the donkey who fell in the well. Once upon a time, <laughs> <laughs> there was a donkey just walking happily along in the forest, just munching and minding its own business. And because it wasn't mindful, he fell into a well. The well was dry, so he didn't drown. And he didn't really sort of injure himself, just a few bruises and scratches. But when the donkey sort of came to his senses, he realized it was the bottom of a well, and there's no way up, because donkeys can't climb. So the only thing the donkey thought he could do was to cry for help, to get someone's attention, otherwise he would die down there of starvation. So he started crying for help. Uh, uh, uh. I can't really do donkey noises. <laughs> As I think now, you have understood, because probably I've got no previous incarnations as a donkey. Those people who imitate animal noises, it must be your last life who was that animal. 
But as for me, I wasn't a donkey in my last life. So, uh, 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 it's the best I can do. Uh, 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 said the donkey again and again. And after a couple of hours, actually, somebody heard him. There was a local farmer. And what's making that noise? And so he came over and saw it was coming from the well, looked down, my goodness, a donkey has fallen down that well. Now that farmer never liked that donkey. The donkey was always eating his farm produce and was being very stubborn, never do what the farmer wanted. And he also realized that well was a very dangerous thing. Somebody might fall in that well, a human. So he thought of a wonderful idea. He could get rid of that dangerous well and the donkey at the same time. He got out a spade and started filling that well with earth. The cruel farmer. Now if you do something like that it's called bad karma. If you do any bad karma you're going to get unpleasant consequences as you will see as this story develops. <laughs> And so, this donkey at the bottom of the well, thinking at first the farm would help him, realized the farm was trying to kill him by shoveling all this dirt over the donkey. And when the donkey realized that, oh, 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 even louder. <laughs> but that didn't stop the farmer. He just kept shoveling more dirt over this donkey. More and more dirt, trying to fill in the well and bury the donkey alive. And after a while, the donkey went quiet and never said anything. Farmer thought, I've killed him, I've buried him, good riddance, and kept on shoveling. But the donkey hadn't died. The donkey, who must have also gone to Nolamara in the previous life, <laughs> had insight. He was a very smart donkey, never underestimate donkeys. His insight was this, instead of complaining when people throw dirt all over you, instead of complaining, just shake it off, tread it in, and he found he was growing a centimetre taller. The next, <laughs> the next shovel full of earth, shake it off, stamp it in, he was another centimetre higher. So every time, every shovel of earth, he was getting closer and closer to the top of the well. Now the farmer, thinking the donkey had died already, paid no attention at all, shovel and shovel, when a pair of donkey ears appeared above the top of the well. <laughs> shovel, 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 shake it off, stamp it in, until a donkey head appeared on the top of the well. And before the farmer realized the donkey was close enough to the surface, it jumped out and bit the farmer on the backside. <laughs> As, not because the, the, the donkey didn't like the farmer, but because he had to show the farmer the law of karma. <laughs> He's just an agent of cause and effect. <laughs> and ran away. And that's how the farmer escaped from the that, that's how the donkey escaped from the well. And the moral of that story is, and I told that to politicians, I even actually told that to the president of Sri Lanka a couple of years ago, all the Sri Lankans here, he loved that story, because being a politician, people are always throwing dirt on you. Stamp it in, stamp, shrug it off, stamp it in, and you get high moral ground. So it's the same with you. People criticize you, your husband calls you ugly, you call him stupid. <laughs> Whatever it is, just shrug it off, stamp it in, and you get closer to the top of the well. <laughs> That's how to deal with difficult people. So if people sort of call me sort of uh, lazy because I haven't got a proper job. <laughs> I say, well, in this time of economic difficulty, I'm freeing the labour market up for you people to get jobs, rather than taking it myself. If people think, oh, you're scared of relationships because you don't have children, I'm saying, I'm making the planet sort of uh, more carbon neutral because if you have kids, how, many how much of a carbon footprint do you get with kids? So like being celibate, I'm doing my bit for overpopulation. So, if they <laughs> so whatever it is, when people criticize you, you can always turn it around, shake it off, and you don't need to think that they're making life difficult for you. You only make life difficult for yourself. No one else does. There is no such thing as a difficult person, basically except yourself. 
So you get yourself right, make peace with yourself, and you find that everything in life will then also be at peace. And all the difficult people will just be people, that's all. Human beings just being human beings. Mosquitoes being mosquitoes. Donkeys being donkeys. Farmers being farmers. How to deal with difficult people. Thank you for listening. So, who's going to be the first difficult person and ask a question? <laughs> Any questions or comments tonight? That's a great way of stopping questions. Let's associate that with the difficult person. No? Going. Go, oh, you've got a question. Okay. Got a question? Okay, children who uh, become difficult if you don't pay attention to them, the attention seekers in life, and sort of how you deal with them. That's just children being children, not being difficult children. You know, it's, you know try and find time with them if you haven't got time with them. So if you can't find time with them. So it's not a difficulty, it's just the nature of children. If they want attention from other people, and they haven't got attention from their parents, sometimes they try it on the, with their teachers. You just do what you can, but you can't please everybody. So where's the difficulty there? The only difficulty is if you think that children shouldn't be like that. Or you think that you shouldn't be like that. But you accept that's part of life, and you do what you can. You can't do more than that. Then difficulty finishes. Embracing the reality that children wanted to seek attention. Is that an answer we should accept? Or Baba Rai sort of skirting around it? I think I think they skirting around it. Very good. You have to point out there's a demon in them, in a sense that you point out that they're causing trouble to other people and difficulty to other people. That has to be pointed out. How you point it out is the interesting way. And sometimes we haven't got the resources to point it out at this particular time. With time we've got other kids to look after in a classroom. But you know, sometimes you can find time to take them aside later on. It reminds me of uh, the late Abbot Placid, of uh, talking about him. He was the Abbot at New Norcia, who died recently. He was a good friend. I went to his funeral service. And I remember at a conference, and in UWA, it was actually Father Frank Brennan was there, the Jesuit priest. And he asked this question. He said, you know, I do work in universities. And so that's so easy to get on with Buddhists, with Hindus, with Jewish, uh, all religions. The only difficulty he has is with the born again, the fundamentalists. You know, these sort of uh, charismatic Christians. He asked Abbot Placid, not me, he said, what would you be your advice to deal with the charismatic Christians, the real troublemakers? And Abbot Placid said, take them out one by one. <laughs> <laughs> it was an outrageous thing for an abbot to say. <laughs> he had a great sense of humour. But then he said afterwards, deal with them later on, singly, one by one. That's actually a very beautiful piece of advice. Because if a kid's a bit of a troublemaker, sometimes you take them by, aside by themselves. It's much easier to deal with. The social context sometimes exacerbates some of that difficulty. Pull them aside later on. Just talk to them one by one, find out what's going on. Sorry? What would you say to them that you can never predict what you're going to say? No way can I predict what I'm going to say on a Friday night. Or somebody actually comes up to me, they've got a problem, what I'm going to say to them. Your job is never plan what you're going to say. If you do, then you're not reacting to the moment. You're not being intuitive, you're not listening to the other person. So your job is bring them in and see what happens. Listen. Be kind. Connect and see what comes next. That's why you should always, as I say, always follow your gut feeling. 
except when you've got irritable bowel syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> so your intuition is actually very strong and very smart. If you can only tap into that by taking away all these plans. Okay, I think that's all you're going to get. I, another question. Wow, they're being very difficult in that corner. <laughs> I'll just take you out afterwards one <laughs> Yeah, come on, what you got? Um, what exactly did the mosquitoes teach you your mind? Were they able to find you back? What the mosquitoes taught me was how wonderful it is to be in Australia when there aren't so many. <laughs> <laughs> now what else they taught me is actually not to react so much. Because when I just let them be, actually there wasn't so many mosquitoes on me. The more I reacted, the more the mosquitoes came. And I found out afterwards that mosquitoes are attracted to the carbon dioxide coming from your pores. The higher metabolism, the more you've got a neon sign to mosquitoes, you know, Ajahn Brahm Steiner, please come in and take a meal. <laughs> but when I really relaxed and I didn't bother about them, because you weren't worrying, your metabolism went down, you were more calm and peaceful which meant not so much carbon dioxide was coming out from your pores, which means eventually they couldn't find you. They actually taught me a great lesson. The more you worry about these things, the more you bring them to you. The more you let go and leave them alone and be at peace, the more invisible you are to mosquitoes. They taught me how to just not worry about things, even if they're irritating. Understanding life sometimes is irritating. The only thing you can do is let it be. Don't fight it. And the irritation disappears. Literally. That's what I learned from mosquitoes. They were great teachers. The more you fought them, the more they came. Okay, so that's enough for this evening. Thanks again for coming. We have now a couple of announcements. So if you'd like to hand over to Anne, who's our events manager on our committee. Uh, give the announcements this evening in Rachel's absence. <laughs>